and here we are again hello good afternoon and welcome to the polls we are coming to you live from our studios here at Kukumimile on your digital terrestrial TV because we are free to air on DSTV channel 421 and GoTV channel 144. Thanks for choosing us. We are Joy News, independent, fearless and credible. This afternoon, President Akufado reiterated his commitment to complete the Agenda 111 hospital project before the end of his tenure. Our commitment to improving our healthcare delivery system is evident in the Agenda 111 initiative. Well, Steve, that's we're asking the question this afternoon. Is this a subtle change of the 18 months timeline given by government to complete the construction of the hospitals? Uh, stay as we find out shortly. Meanwhile, the president is equally expected to join his counterparts in the sub region here in Accra to discuss worrying trends of military takeovers in West Africa. And don't forget that residents of Apiati are to be relocated to nearby towns ahead of the rainy season. We'll hear from government as they assure construction uh, of the community will commence in April this year. And predictions obviously are trickling in as the Black Stars gets ready to lock horns with the Super Eagles of Nigeria later tonight at the Baba Yaira Sports Stadium. I know it. You sure? You, ah, 100%. Hey, you gave him a why? Gave him pass. Ah, Nigeria. Oh, Ghana, Nigeria, there. It's not about form, it's not about the number of players you have playing abroad and all that. Yeah. No, no, no. The euphoria is on. Certainly, you need to be a part of this. We'll cross you over live to Kumasi to gauge the mood of Ghanaians ahead of the game. Don't forget that this is the polls brought to you by Global Communities Digni Lu, Affordable Safe Sanitation. This afternoon, we are streaming live on YouTube and all of our social media handles. It's at Joy News on TV. Don't forget to tweet at us with the hashtag, the polls. My personal handle is at Blesses Ogan. Stay for details. And this afternoon, President Akufado has reiterated his commitment to complete the Agenda 111 hospital project before the end of this year, uh, his tenure actually. The, the ambitious project seeks to construct 101 district hospitals at, uh, and each unit uh, would actually cost government about 17 million US dollars. Though this is the second time government has actually changed the timelines for the completion of the project, President Akufado is confident the project one once completed, will transform the country's healthcare system. Government's commitment to improving our healthcare delivery system is evident in the Agenda 111 initiative. This project will provide 101 standard 100-bed district hospitals with accommodation for doctors and nurses in districts without district hospitals. Six new regional hospitals for each of the six new regions. Rehabilitate the Afia and Quanta Hospital in the Western Region. One new regional hospital for the Western Region. And three psychiatric hospitals for each of the three zones of the country. That is the North, Middle, and Coastal. And the entire package at an estimated cost of 1.765 billion United States dollars. Such a development will help make Ghana a center of medical excellence and a preferred destination for medical tourism in West Africa. Well, so there you have it, President Akufando uh, addressing congregants uh, there at the uh, 60th anniversary of the establishment of the University of Ghana Medical uh, School. Our medical schools have, a good rep have got a good reputation and have been training good doctors and dentists who find work with some ease in all parts of the world. But the doctor-dentist population ratio in our country still remains unsatisfactory after 65 years of nationhood. We currently do not have the right numbers of doctors, dentists, and healthcare professionals with the right mix of skills and expertise in our regions, districts, and deprived communities, especially for the newly created regions and districts. The news of doctors refusing postings to these areas 
is not particularly distressing. I encourage all medical practice to follow the worthy example of your great forebears, like Dr. Charles Eastman, Dr. Evan Zanford, and their likes, who readily accepted postings in their early years, at a time when the national infrastructure was even more harrowing than it is today. Well, so that's uh, President Akufado speaking there. Uh, there's a lot happening as far as the, the president is concerned, but we'll be breaking all of that down for you. First of all, let's focus on this project of Agenda 111. Fortunately to be uh, talking now to Dr. Titus Bayo, who's the General Secretary for the Ghana Medical Association. Uh, he's joining us via Zoom. Thank you so much, sir, for your time here on the poll. So uh, what do you suspect could be the challenge confronting the rapid um, development and execution of this uh, Agenda 111. Uh, Dr. Titus Bayo, if you're still with us, I'm, I'm trying to find out uh, from you as a health expert and obviously uh, stakeholders in this, um, what do you suspect is that challenge affecting government's ability to quickly execute the plan of constructing these hospitals? Um, we seem to have lost um, Dr. Titus Bayo there, but if you're with us, the president is uh, up to a lot of activities this afternoon uh, because ECOWAS heads of state have once again converged here in Accra to discuss the worrying trend of military takeovers in the sub region. My colleague uh, Elton Brobe uh, attended the summit. He joins us via Zoom with more uh, on that. Uh, Elton, first of all, let's talk about. Uh, the Malian situation, we understand that that's on the table as well. Uh, what more do we know aside all of these things that are coming up at the meeting? Um, there seems to be a challenge uh, there as well, uh, reaching Elton. Elton will bring us all the, all the latest happening uh, right here in the crowd where we're expecting heads of state to uh, join us. We'll be back shortly after this break. Well, so let's stay on the uh, ECOWAS meeting, which is happening currently in the national capital, Accra. Uh, obviously, there's a need for us to get some updates from Elton uh, Broby, who's joining us um, from uh, the uh, center where all of this is unfolding. Uh, Elton, where exactly is this meeting being held and what more can you tell us about the summit? The meeting is taking place at Kempisi Hotel. And just some few minutes ago, the opening ceremony ended. President Kupanu is chair near the uh, block, read his opening remarks, which lasted for just a minute. He decided not to go into details and to just ask the media personnel to leave the chamber to allow member states to begin discussions on the many issues that are before. Now, we know that they are looking into the political situation in Mali, in Kenya, and in Burkina Faso. So, Kowas town a few uh, weeks ago, especially after uh, the political unrest in Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso, some individuals to understand the situation and report to the regional block. Now, Nigeria's president, good luck, Jonathan, was asked to meet it, their return to constitutional rule in Mali, and he will be presenting his report to member states. The issue about Mali is not new. They've been under a military regime for some time now. We are talking about almost two to three years. There have been attempts, there have been sanctions, there have been suspensions, there's been all manner of areas taken against them to force the military ruler, Asimi Gorita, to return the country to democratic rule. But as I said to you right now, the country is still in a military regime of a sort, even though. Asimi Goita has, in a way, uh, declared himself interim president until uh, the return of constitutional rule. He mm. has given himself five years to do so. Right. This particular meeting, my information is that he was invited, but he declined to participate. Rather, he sent two I, 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 I was just, I was just about to ask you about uh, that situation, because initial reports we had uh, was that uh, some rep representatives uh, of the military junta will be here in the country to, to have a discussion with the heads of state. But why is that not happening anyway? So, Asimi Goethe himself is not attending this meeting in his place. There are two high-ranking government officials from Mali who are representing him at this meeting. And the situation about, about Mali is that he has decided 
to conduct national elections uh, in the next five years. He had told ECOWAS that he will require at least five years before he will return the country to constitutional rule, even though ECOWAS had given him up to November of last year to do so. When that did not happen, ECOWAS decided to impose additional sanctions on uh, Mali, which includes uh, the closing of borders with neighboring ECOWAS countries, uh, travel restrictions, and other sanctions. That has not stopped them from going ahead with what they want to do. They are still sticking to the five-year window before they will return the country to constitutional rule. That's about money, because this issue has dragged on for over three years now. Google and Jonathan's latest report will inform the decision going forward. And I'm told that the representatives who are here at the behest of Atim Egoita will tell ECOWAS leaders the roadmap that uh, Mali has instituted that is guiding them in the process leading up to the holding of national elections. We let the substantive president, members of parliament, and other you know, elected officials. That will be done. How ECOWAS will react to this will contain in a communicator that will come out after this meeting. Ghana's foreign minister has two major assignments to do. She also led a committee to Guinea and also to Burkina Faso. So she has two reports to present to the leadership of ECOWAS. When all said and done, ECOWAS leaders uh, will have to now deliberate on the, on the three reports and then come to a decision as to what to do with this country. What they've made it clear is that they will not countenance any attempt to uh, 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 hold on to power through unlawful means. And in their description of unlawful means is through the use of uh, forceful means, you know, uh, uh, abolishing constitutional terms and also using the military uh, to, you know, take over power. That is something that they cannot accept under any circumstances. Mm. Which, yeah, I, I mean, it sounds to be that some of these sanctions have not really, uh, you know, brought about the intended effect. What other sanctions are available to ECOWAS, those issues are what they will be discussing. I'm sure that by the close of this meeting, we are looking at around 5 to 6 p.m., they will, they will be done, and then the communique will come out, spelling out how ECOWAS hope to deal with these countries, President Kufuari the describes that recalcitrant. Mm. Uh, so, how many heads of states do we have currently in that meeting? So, apart from uh, apart from uh, Mali, uh, Guinea, and Burkina Faso, all others are represented here. Those those without their substantive president are either the vice president or their foreign minister. But apart from the country, do you remember that Mali, Guinea, and Burkina Faso, after the instability in their country, Ecuador's first response was to suspend them from the regional bloc. So they are not invited. It was only Asim Goita who was invited to brief member states on what has been done to appease uh, the collective resolve of Air Corps. Unfortunately, he's not here. Two other people are representing him. So apart from these three countries, all others are represented here at this meeting. Mm. Uh, Althea, I'm, I'm grateful that you're giving us an update on that. Uh, Richard Komado is a security analyst. Um, he, he is also uh, joining us uh, to, to analyze all of this and, and the meeting uh, that's uh, going on a, as we speak. Um, Mr. Kumara, welcome to the program. Now, uh, are you certain that this meeting will yield any positive results? Okay, now uh, today the Black Stars will lock horns with the Super Eagles uh, of Nigeria at the Babayara Sports Stadium, Kumasi. Uh, well, already football fans are... Uh, of course, uh, in that jubilant mood, uh, many of them uh, here in the newsroom, uh, some people uh, have even had dreams about the scoreline uh, of this game, and they are not alone. So we took to the streets to gauge the mood of the Ghanaians, uh, of Ghanaians uh, ahead of the game, and uh, some uh, guests uh, are actually guessing um, and making some predictions about the game. Give them pass. Ah, Nigeria. Oh, Ghana, Nigeria, there. it's not about form, it's not about the number of players you have playing abroad and all that. No, no, no. But, I mean, you've seen the players, the caliber of players they have. Yes. And you've matter. seen our, 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 our lineup. Of course, it doesn't matter. You see, when you, when you look at their midfield, nobody is better than Pate. So, for the midfield, we've conquered there. And then an attack, maybe you have some slight 
I don't, I don't think our attackers are at par with the Nigerians, but still, I mean, they're going to score them. So what's the score? 3-0. Hey, of course. You are so confident? Yes. Well, is it a Baba Yara thing or you just think that we have a good team? Um, that, that one might contribute, let's say, 40% of, but the players, the quality we have, I'm sure we'll win. Right. Yes. Oh, the few score you like four. For a normal four save, Charlie. It was scoring like eight save. Hey, oh, why? ah, but when a team no good, eh? The team no good. But ah, uh, they was scoring like four. First half, first half three. Then second half make the hard one. But they, but they the captain. Though. Oh, but but be you know say when a team no good. But if discipline day there, you go feel the best to be same. Maybe draw. But but with that game day for Baba Yara, that no, that I one go give. The spirit alone for that, that for that side, Charlie. Be massive, but it be miracle if we if we win them, then it be miracle. But the best we go feel gets be draw. But Charlie make them score. We make yeah, you know what? But when I go be oh, you go be me, mom. But Charlie, the team not really good. So then for score, you make you know say the oh, team really not good. So say everything, then we'll fix everything for the team okay, inside. So we are expecting an interesting game, but overall, I'm expecting a win for Ghana. Any score line? Uh, I think a 2 0 score line for Ghana. 2 0? Yes, sure. 2 0 sure. against Nigeria. Sure. You are confident of that? You know, the, the record we've got at the Baba Yara Sports Stadium, it, it will be difficult for this Nigerian team to break that record. Wow. And so I think uh, it, it, it's not going to be a comfortable win, but I'm predicting a 2 0 for Ghana. Okay. Right. Because our lineup is okay. Our lineup is good? Yeah. Uh, so, any score line, what's your prediction? Um, 2 0. 2 0 against Nigeria? Against, yeah. Really? Now some parliamentarians, including Deputy Speaker Joe Osewusu, were spotted rocking their black uh, stars jersey in Parliament. And there you have it on your screens now uh, with the Ghana flag uh, there as well um, in Parliament. Meanwhile, a black stars uh, jersey is uh, fast selling in Kumasi as well. Love FM's Nanai Aljima has uh, been engaging some of the vendors. God is Good Sportswear is one of the vibrant wholesale sports shops in Kumasi. During the African Cup of Nations 2021, the business stocked over a thousand pieces of Black Stars replica jerseys with the hope of making good sales. But they were left disappointed. Shop owner Emmanuel Ousu is, however, overwhelmed by the current show of support for the Black Stars, which translates into purchase of jerseys and paraphernalia. <laughs> Even the yellow ones, which are not liked by many, are being accepted. For the white ones, they are almost finished. Moving the game to Kumasi has helped us. Prices, no. Prices, no. Original, no. Yeah, they give 50. This year, it's two costs, right? At least 80 cities. Then thank God football have bring us together once again to show who is the king. Uh, Captain of the Super football. Eagles of Nigeria, Ahmed Musa, admits the clash nicknamed Jolof Derby is more than a football match. It's about politics, Nigeria, Ghana. It's about the Jolof that you just mentioned, Nigeria, Ghana. About music, <laughs> acting. What he said, you have Fufu and you have Eba. Which one people will taste very well? So it's like Ghana go to a uh, World Cup or Nigeria go to World Cup. Everybody wish in this West Africa that two of them go, but it come to a situation that one of them have to drop. And we are not going to drop. They have to drop. So they know it. And Former captain of the Black Stars, Sami Osaikofor, will rate the game as one of the biggest games on the African soil. I quite remember we have a game in Nigeria whereby Abedi Pele wasn't even in the team, but we put his name in the team sheet. And his name come on the, what do you call it, the scoreboard. So was a, a, a bit confused for the Nigerians. And uh, by the time that they realized that he's not part of the team, they have already thinking about him, how to play against him and leave all that Elam Tony In 1955, Ghana beat Nigeria seven goals to nil in the Accra Sports Stadium. Dominating this fixture was legendary Babayara. Definitely for the Jorah Rice, I think I'll give it to Ghana because I enjoy the Jorah Rice very nicely. But for the football? For the football, leave it for Nigeria, they will win.
Ifyom Achibion Agban has lived in Ghana for over a decade. He is married to a Ghanaian with kids. I, I remember a friend of mine told me that when when Nigerian win, I should not pass his place again. <laughs> I should, I should pass the other way because he don't want to see me that I came and there Nigerian people win and that's why he was telling me if I if Nigerian lose I will be fine you will not be happy in the home oh actually I will be happy there's, there's no two about it I can't leave my children because of the football then definitely I will be I will be fine they'll laugh at you oh actually they, they, they might say hey then you Nigerian lose Nigerian lose oh life go on <laughs> For some time, mainly in Kumase, the city that qualified the stars to the previous World Cup tournaments, lost interest in the national team for poor performance, among other reasons. It however seems the rivalry between Ghana and Nigeria in the game of football is rejuvenating the love for the black stars. 4-0 in Babayara. When we get to Nigeria, we can give them a draw. That one, we are not bothered. I'm sure you want crying actually, but Friday we will. We are, we are killing them off, like straightforward. It's four or nothing. It's no OBN Chebi Biaso, non for Donne, and Nizi, and Thai Black Star for it. Are you confident of a victory for Ghana? Yeah, I'm, I'm confident, yeah. The number of Chaya Quack was the same one, but I mean, I'm saying Ghana, dear, yeah, quite a quack was she. But the Nigerian community in Kumase is ready to match up the home team in terms of numbers at the stadium. We're actually hoping it's going to be a tough match because we are a bit confident that our star players can help us get the win. Okay, I would say um, mostly the attack, especially as Ndidi is missing. So yeah, the attack. I'm, I'm looking to see the pace of Adioma Lukman in life because he's really, really fast on FIFA. Well, I think we have enough in attack to overpower almost anyone right now. So we have Moses Simon, lots of guys who can make a difference for us. So very confident. Until the final whistle is blown at the Barbara Sports Stadium, the talk of superiority among the two countries will continue to dominate conversations. For Joy News, Nana Yaojima Kumase. Well, so uh, let's have some discussions on this. Uh, Joel Botte is with Joy Sports, uh, joining us now with uh, more insight into the game. Um, Joel, so it's good to see you uh, just hours ahead of the match. So uh, what's your expectation? Uh, I mean, now that we have a clear picture of who's going to be featuring for Ghana and then the Super Eagles as well, what's your expectation uh, for this match? This game, um, it looks like it's going to be a very close one to call mm. because uh, the Ghanaians are playing at home and therefore having a home advantage does not necessarily mean um, you're going to take the victory. So we're facing a Nigerian side that's top class and it will be a close one because everyone is seeing the fact that the Nigerians on paper stand, stand a chance of taking this victory. So um, having a stadium like Babaya is where I want to focus on it. Now I would like us to look at some of the statistics of the Babaya Stadium starting from 2006 oh. where we had the qualifiers and when we look at that we'll be able to see that uh, with, the first, with the first few qualifiers we, we, we did very well we're able to get into the, the, the frame of um, qualification. As we can see, 2-0 um, starting against Somalia. And we went all the way to um, Uganda and got a 2-0 win over there. And we considered just one goal and scored 11. And at that time, we, 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 in terms of attendance, it was not so big because we, we previously, in previous World Cup qualifiers, we did not stand a chance of going. We were underdogs and we did not make it. So we consider that the average attendance was 28,000. Now if you come to 2010, when we were able to get our second um, World Cup participation, you see that an effect from the 2006 led us to here as well, where we see the increase in stadium attendance to 36,000. And we were able to get a, a good round of results at Babayara. Now when we come to 2014, where everyone was happy with our performance in 2010, oh. we also saw that increase in terms of um, stadium attendance, 38,500, and we had a 100% win rate at, at, at the qualifiers for the, for the 2014 World Cup. So it speaks a lot, what Babayara does for us. And when we come to 2018, this is where the results show what Babayara means. And we, we had a poor performance at the 2014 World Cup. It translated into how fans were enthusiastic about what we do um, in terms of a footballing nation and there was the, the average attendance to Baba Yara for the 2018 World Cup qualifiers was quite low and so it tells a lot that the, the crowd have something to do in terms of what the team makes or what the team is able to put out there so we're looking for that as well 
um, on average, we can look at the average of everything that we've done at Babayara. And when we look at that, we see that Ghana has been able to achieve so much playing at Babayara. For a fun fact, since 2006, when we started our qualifiers, we've not lost a single day, a single game when it comes to World Cup qualifiers. So, uh, Babayara is a very, very um, instrumental figure to, to, to what we do mm. in the World Cup. Right. Um, shortly as well, we'll be gauging the mood in Kumasi to find out um, what's happening there. But uh, let's talk about the Super Eagles. It appears that in the Ghanaian media, we've not focused uh, a bit more on our uh, opponents. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, what do they come come to the field with uh, in terms of experience or what, what it is that we should be on the lookout for? So in terms of the Nigerians, mm. the strong point of the Nigerians is their attack. And, and I would like us to also look at the Nigerian forwards because when we look at them, we see why there's so much talk about their attackers. They have Victor Oshimen, Odoin Igalo, Sadi Kumar, Kelechi Inacho, and Emmanuel Dennis. All these five players are top-notch for their clubs. If you look at the goal scored for each of them, you see three of them are in double digits for goals, and also one of them in terms of assists that Sadi Kumar. And also, the way the Nigerians set up, they usually play with either Inacho behind the striker or they play two top usually. So you see Inacho behind the striker, such as um, in the AFCON, we saw him behind a striker. And, and we can see him behind Oshimen, who is a serial goal scorer for Napoli, 15 goals this season. So Nigeria have some, some, some attacking prowess that would definitely cause some damage, but we would have to limit how, we, how they are able to get into positions to create that damage. I believe Ghana has what it takes. I still tip us in this, this particular game played by Bayara because it, it speaks so much. Now, if you look at the heat map of our attackers, we can see Christopher Entry. I believe he can be a strong point for us because he, he's one that doesn't really stand in the middle. His focal point is not really in the middle. So he can play off the wide areas and that brings an advantage to us. Same for Emmanuel Dennis, who's of Nigeria, can also play in, in wide areas and also in the middle area. He does that for Watford. These are some of the players that we can also have a look at that in terms of um, attacking prowess. I think they've all got, we've all got what it takes. If Ghana is able to take their chances and, and, and capitalize on every opportunity given them, we can definitely take the results here and hope for the best in Nigeria. Oh. Uh, and uh, we've been seeing footages of some uh, Ghanaian officials who are already uh, in Kumasi trying to uh, cheer up the, 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 the black stars as well. And not, and not just the uh, high-ranking officials, uh, even the indigents and residents of Kumasi seem to be elated about um, uh, the, the match being played in that part of the country. What, what will that add to the mix and, and to this whole decision to play the, the game there? Yeah, so... As I said earlier, Babayara yeah. is almost a fortress for Ghana. Right. So if you understand that bit of it, you know that each and everything we do at Babayara is significant. Each and every person that goes, each support coming from that region is massive. And we, we, we love that about the Kumasi folks. They always give their all to the Black Stars. So with having such dignitaries up there, even speaking of the universities, KNUSDA, Katanga boys are out there in their numbers. It speaks a lot for Ghana that when it comes to such a big game, regardless of things that have happened in the past, the support would not go down for the national team. And so I expect this to be a, a sort of backing to us and help us achieve the results we needed. Mm. Uh, and if you're watching us at home as well, feel free to join us. Uh, the lines will be on your screens right now for you to share your predictions with us. 0302 116. Uh, 691 um, so 0302-211-691 or 2 these are the lines on which you can uh, also join the conversation and share your predictions with us uh, tell us what you think about tonight's match uh, Joel Wote is still here uh, still analyzing all of the issues uh, with us so uh, Joel um, okay just before we do this first call out. Uh, I guess um, there's a need for us to look at the injuries as well. That's been a concern for some um, experts who say this could have a toll on the Black Stars. How about that as well? Um, in terms of injuries, it's quite unfortunate Ghana is missing Edmund Ado, who's confirmed to be injured. Also, last night there was a bit of a knock to Kofi Tre, which um, comes as a blow to the Ghanaians because if you look at what Kofi Tre has done for us, Speaking from the last African Cup of Nations, it was very, very instrumental to that last game against Comoros. And also, um, his form for Sao Paulo in the German second division 
I'm sorry, first division as in terms of the second Bundesliga, he's been instrumental to the club's success. They currently sit top of the, the, the league table and he's he's had goals and assists in there for them. He's been on fine form. So we are expecting that for that to translate into our national team, but quite unfortunate that he had a blow. We are hoping that it's nothing serious and he can still feature in today's game. Because he's one person I expect that if he does feature, he can grab something in there for us. But unfortunately, on the Nigerian side, they are without Wilfred Ndidi, who has been their key man in terms of midfield. He's done ball distribution, ball progression and all. And also, they are without their goalkeeper, Manduka Okoye, who is their number one. And so, it's a big blow to both nations. They are having some injuries in there. We are hoping to see how they cope mm. without such players. Uh, Gary L. Smith is joining us uh, from the venue grounds as well, uh, just to give us some updates uh, and a feel of what's happening ahead of the match. Uh, Gary, what, what can you tell us? Hi, good afternoon. Um, yeah, I'm just opposite the stadium. And, well, what I can tell you is that if you heard any contrary reports that Kumasi was not ready and that Ghanaians, for some reason, are angry with the team and are not coming to the stadium, please, discard anything. As early as 7 a.m., 7 a.m., people were trooping to the stadium, the stadium because, you know, electronic ticketing was used this time and so a few people had some issues with their ticketing systems, and so they came to resolve them. Most people even had tickets, but just came to hang around to check what was going on. And of course, you had the media also besieging the place. As you may have heard, 1,000 media accreditation applications were had, and 468 have been given. It's one of the biggest I've seen in my career for a Black Star game. Mm. That is not, you know, like um, a tournament. 468 media accreditations have been given and from around the world. And we've been told that a significant number is from outside the country. I'm currently in a bar. Uh, for those of you who know Kumase, it's my kitchen just opposite the stadium. And um, I mean, it's, everybody's waiting to get into the stadium. I see people in red, yellow and green everywhere in various colors of the Black Stars. Also, um, a Nigerian population, I think, around as well. And, you know, a few of them are spoken to express happiness at the fact that, you know, they were having a few chitters about um, probable hostile treatment, but everybody has been good to them and all that. So I'm guessing that with it's two, just after 2.30 now, I believe, right? If I'm not mistaken. Time is, yeah, 3.30. 3.30, so we have about four hours to kick off, and the atmosphere has been building for hours and hours now. People selling wares, paraphernalia, and stuff like that, and it's really, really good, really, mm. really good. Uh, Gary, um, we're also learning of reports that the tickets have sold out, and yet um, someone was also arrested earlier today uh, for trying to sell fake tickets as well. What, what more can you say about that? Well, it's even in the most advanced football countries, you always have to deal with tickets out, don't you? So there are people who specialize in looking at when they can buy the tickets, the premium tickets as early as possible and make a margin out of it. And the security agencies are always, you know, on the lookout for them. So uh, we understand that the police and the authorities had a tip about these two Nigerians, a man and a woman, and so they nabbed them this morning. Um, I'm hearing, I can't confirm this, but what I'm told is that they had made sales of more than 4,000 CDs, and so they were picked up with that as well. Mm. Okay, so let's talk technicalities now. Kofichere has been trending on social media all day um, for a number of reasons, but technically speaking, what can you say about um, his readiness for the game or otherwise? We have no idea. We are, we are as much in the dark as you are. I mean, I'm sure this is not news to you, for the past two or three weeks, the Ghana FA have been incredibly tight lipped about everything. You know, they've, they've hardly spoken. The only media conference they've had, or media contact they've had, was yesterday when we had the official media conference where Otuadu and Thomas Pate came to speak as well. There has been absolutely no official word about anything, and our usual sources are not saying much. Uh, my colleague Mustafa Nabula said on the media news that it's likely may not start the game, but again, that is not official, that's just according to what his sources 
say, but there's no official word at the moment. Mm. Uh, Gary, we'll get back to you later in the uh, day as All the... Right, thanks. Uh, as, as events unfold. But Gary uh, Al Smith joining us uh, live uh, from Kumasi. He will be uh, giving you live commentary on Joy 99.7 FM as well. Don't forget that uh, Joel Bate is, is also helping us out here understand uh, the technicalities of the game. So um, as we wrap up on this uh, one, what's your prediction? I keep asking you, I asked you yesterday uh, about your predictions. You were uncertain at the time, but I'm sure that you have all the facts which you now uh, just to point at something, either a victory for the Black Stars or something we're not, all not expecting to hear. So um, I'm predicting a victory for the Black Stars right here at home, mm -hmm. but I can't see it for Nigeria. So mm -hmm. let's just look at home and I'll just say it's possibly going to be... Okay, so, so, so your prediction is just for what's happening now, now. here, yeah. today. Yeah. But for the second leg, we're not too you sure of the outcome. Happen, yeah. Is it because you're not too confident about the team and, and, and their style of play? Not really about the team. Actually, I think the technical team plays a role because I've mm -hmm. not seen them in operation. I've not seen what they can do. And let's not forget, their head coach, of the head coach of the Black Stars, Otohado, has not coached, has not been a head coach in any official game. So. That, that, that is the problem. I can't tell his tactics and all. And that's what we are all in. We are all in the right. dark in terms of whether Ghana or Nigeria. Nobody knows his tactics. Nobody mm. knows his style of play. So as a result of that, I'm just a little bit concerned to, to that. I believe that if you're able to see his first game from there, we can deduce some facts and some figures from there to tell what could happen with mm. the next game. But for now, I'm, I'm, in general, I believe that with the atmosphere, with the mentality and with everything that's happening, I believe that the Black Stars can get a victory here. Well, uh, Joel Bate is with our uh, Joy Sports team. Uh, this is still The Pulse. We take a short break. we we'll return to talk about uh, the reconstruction of uh, a PAT. Stay with us. And you're welcome back to The Pulse. Now, government says the reconstruction of APT will commence by end of April. The community, which was uh, brought down to its knees after a truckload of explosives accidentally exploded in the area, leaving many injured and scores displaced. Uh, government says it's now committed to rebuilding the town into a green modern model um, community in in the meantime we know that the residents are living in makeshift tents ahead of the rainy season government is giving indications that plans are far advanced to relocate the residents um, to a more conducive living space meanwhile the reconstruction team has completed the uh, special plan uh, for the reconstruction and joining us now in studio is head of research with the land use and uh, special planning uh, authority Lupsa uh, Al Hassan Mohammed Damba. Al Hassan, welcome to the program. Thank you. So um, that accident was, was was very deadly. We all know the impacts on the community, and uh, where we are now is a stage where uh, life is getting back to normal. Uh, now that we know that there is hope, at least for residents in in getting back their community, what plans do you have in place to um, reconstruct the area and to uh, put it back into a, a use uh, in a, such a way that will be very much sustainable. Thank you. Um, as you may know already, government committed to rebuilding the community after the accident and uh, the Land Use and Special Planning Authority was opted onto the committee in charge of the reconstruction project. Now our terms of reference was straightforward to prepare a befitting land use plan that would guide the entire reconstruction, including building the houses, building the roads, putting in the, all the necessary infrastructure, and making sure that the community has uh, an appropriate land use mix that makes it more sustainable, livable, and uh, more importantly also supports the local economy of the Apieta community. Mm. Uh so, so, so which means that, that that will be your special mandate, ensuring that you, you bring back the community to life in, in such a manner that would, would still... Are you putting it back as it used to, or there's a new plan that you have for the area, you know? Yes, we're supposed to, first of all, restore the people to their normal lives, mm -hmm. 
and more importantly, improve the community over and above uh, uh, its previous state. Okay. And that involves a lot. Um, the plan has been done in such a way that um, it takes care of the housing needs of the 870 inhabitants of the community. It covers an area of about 205 acres and makes very generous provisions for, first of all, the priorities on building the houses. And so about 40% of the land is earmarked for building houses mm. and 28% uh, for roads, 15 for green spaces because we are supposed to make sure that the community is very sustainable. Uh, also, if you get to a theater, you would realize it was the inner or the core areas that were, that was flattened. And so the focus is to clear and build all the houses there, numbering about 124 units, comprising one bedroom units to six or seven bedroom units. Uh, and, and sorry for cutting through, but the number that you're giving us now, you're saying it's 100 and, and 24. And 24. Yes. Uh, what is informing this number of houses that you're putting um, back up? Because uh, after the accident, the impression and the reports um, that, that were received from, from the community and the videos and footages that we saw, uh, it appears that the damage was quite far reaching. So what informed the decision to reconstruct a 124? Anew, yes. Uh, yes, what's informing that? Really? Yes, we, the planning process began with extensive data collection inventory, um, finding out exactly how many houses were there prior to the explosion. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the core area of the town, uh, we have 124 units gone. And then in the outer perimeter areas of, of, of the village, uh, there were a range of damages, um, uh, including you know, roofs ripping off to shattered windows and so on and so forth. So um, I'm still giving you the figure. So we're going to replace 124 units, comprising, comprising okay. one bedroom yeah. units to seven bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And then in the outer perimeter areas, we have 416 units that will undergo repairs. Okay, so that's where the difference is. Because yes. I was wondering, I mean, yes. 124 yes. is such a yes. small Build figure. fresh right. from the scratch, mm -hmm. and then 416 would undergo various levels of So 416 yes. and then one to, to four. That's four. Right. That's so, right. so all these put together should, should be ranging yeah, somewhere around 600 or, or okay. 40. 40. Yeah, about 540 yeah. facilities will either be constructed anew or, or rehabilitated. Yeah, rehabilitated. Right. Th that's what you're targeting. Yes, yes. Right. And then in addition, we have made provision for expansion of the town mm -hmm. or the village. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's fast, you know, merging with Bogoso. And so we have created nearly 100 additional parcels to aid the, the, the expansion of, of, of the village. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me add that the to make it sustainable as the, the president directed, uh, we have put in place about 26 different parks and uh, reserve areas where um, the people are not supposed to build. We're going to plant trees. Some comprise wetland areas. Mm -hmm. There is also a water body that we have uh, considered as a very sensitive ecological asset and so it's also seriously and heavily protected. Uh, so these are some of the provisions. There are hitherto certain services that did not exist in the, in the village and which we are making provision for such as uh, a taxi rank, we have an, an open market, we have a football park, we have a place for a police, police post, we have a place for clinic. Uh, we do have a very important provision which is a memorial uh, to, to, to build in, in, in memory of those who uh, lost their lives. And uh, as part of this memorial, we're going to have a miniature, um, a recreation of the old structures that were demolished. So we would not totally erase from our memories the structures that used to be there before the accident, because that also constitutes uh, their heritage. Mm. And so we have 
taking care of all okay of we'll, we'll talk about the timelines shortly but i'm still concerned about the facilities that you intend to rehabilitate or put to put up a, a new the the concern has got to do with some structures that are not within the category of residential facilities because you talked about a one bedroom house which is the standard or average model you're going for for the 124 buildings how about the um, religious centers for instance and churches that were destroyed due to this um, uh, accident because I, I recall vividly that Maxwell Agba was there on the grounds for us at Joy News uh, and then he brought us a story of a whole church that was collapsed due to the explosion. Right. So how about these facilities as well? So that's the Church of Pentecost, yes. So okay, yes. So you know about the facility I'm Yes, we, this is a very thorough and detailed work. Right. Done. So uh, there's provision for about six churches in this village. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, what we could see clearly was, was that church facility. I mean, yeah. your reporter spoke mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. if you get to town, that's what you would see. But after the first plan was drafted, we had to go back to the community, place a plan before them, and ask them to make their contributions. And that was when we discovered that there were five more churches that we didn't take yeah. care of. So all of that has been taken care of. There's one mosque also uh, provided for for very you know a Muslim population of just about three households. Mm -hmm. So, so that is also been taken care of. Let me assure you that uh, the planning process has been very very participatory, and so. I do not think we have left anything out that is of uh, importance to the community. Mm -hmm. they, after the first that they made, for example, they brought up the provision for a taxi rank. We thought that it was a matter of vehicles driving by and then we created a service lane for vehicles to park and then they get on board them, but they felt they should have their own taxi rank. And in addition, we have a market beside which a whole commercial vehicle terminal proposed uh, has been provided for. Uh, you made a point about the, the, the commercial activities. Yes, uh, Apiate is a very vibrant community and has its local economy hinged on Fantikenke, for example. And so there were a number of shops um, you know, fronting the highway. Provision has been made, except that this time, the design ha is not going to allow them to interface the highway directly. Mm -hmm. We have put in some curbs and greenery between the highway and them, but they are still visible enough um, so that by driving by, you can still sight them and pick whatever mm -hmm. you want to buy. Right. Uh, so let's talk about the timelines. Um, how long is it going to take for, for those projects to, to be completed? The two are given to the uh, committee is to ensure by close of this year everything is done and dusted. Uh, in April, that's, I mean, approximately 30 days from now, right. we're going to start construction works. Uh, the engineers are already on the field working very busily to ensure that they put in all the roads. Um, um, about six kilometers of roads will be built in the inner areas and in addition to other distributor routes in total will give us about 12 kilometers of routes to be done. The roads are also have been planned in a hierarchy uh, because the community is not one that has too many vehicles and so motorization has been limited in favor of let's say cycling and pedestrians and so if you look at the design we have made provision for a lot of lanes um, and then a few thoroughfares because we want to minimize the carbon footprints, you know, in the community, for example. Mm. So, so that's what we're working with by the end of the year. Uh, are, yes. you, are you awarding all of this to just one contractor who will be working? Because the assumption is looking at the number of facilities you want to put, put up. Um, you, you may need more hands to, to, to work out and, and to make the, the, the strict deadline that you've been giving by the ministry. Yeah, certainly not. Mm. We have a procurement process we have a procurement right process, so that's going to be strictly followed mm. um, the adverts are going to come out i'm sure even starting from monday you would see some adverts uh, in respect of so okay so so the advertisement will start on monday but then uh, you're targeting to start construction by uh, 30th of april no the advert is not for construction oh, okay for right. example there's a, an open design mm -hmm. 
competitions, you know, right. that would allow individuals to quickly, you know, share their thoughts and the on, on how to get the That's place like, how the working. Right. Look like. We already have an idea about how okay. they should look like, but we want more contributions mm. so we can mm. we can get the best. Fund. Right. Uh, one critical thing to this is also about funding. Um, we know that government is doing its best to cover up some, some funds and, and the private organizations are also helping. Would you say that you have enough funds or perhaps you're still open to the idea of receiving help from goodwill organizations? Yes, I don't think we, would, we have enough. Mm. Uh, it's still open today during our meeting with the, with the journalist. Uh, it was made clear that we're okay. still expecting very much a uh, lot of contributions. Oh, so you still want more support? Yeah, more, more, more. Mm. So we can do more. We can... Because remember, the plan is so elaborate, and to build the units wouldn't be enough. Mm -hmm. We need to build the roads, the drains. We need to plant trees. We need to build public facilities like schools, you know, for a clinic, a memorial. I mean, these cost a lot. Yeah, have, have you know, put a cost to it? The total that cost? has been worked on by right. the engineering, you know, mm. our engineering. Mm. But for now, you can say that you need more, more funds to, to yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. But, but, exactly. but is that inability of having the full complement of the funds going to affect the timelines because if you don't have the money the expectation is that the end of the year as you're targeting to complete no, these no, projects no, may, not may be affected. We, we keep working remember even if we had all the resources right now we couldn't use it okay and so we're mm. going to be working alongside and expecting but that. one thing you're not compromising on is the buildings they, they would happen whether or not yes, you have they, support from, they would from the organization by God's grace. they would mm. happen they would have to happen back because that is the the flagship component mm -hmm. uh, of the entire project right. the units have to be in place because currently remember they are in temporary camps we need to quickly get you know a place for all of them to to be yeah. housed and so uh, that is a key priority but remember just building the houses wouldn't be enough mm -hmm. we need to add all these compliments yeah. to make the plan what it is. Yeah. Uh, as, as the, the president talks about modifications, uh, a green city. What's that going to be looking like? Yeah, so by green we have the, um, um, the plan, the fauna aspect. So we're going to have a lot. As I told you, we have um, about 15% of the entire 205 acres of land going to be dedicated to greenery. So we have reserve, we have parks, and we have and then in addition to that, we're going to have trees planted and lined along all the uh, um, um, roads uh, in the community. Uh, but remember, to greenery doesn't only mean planting trees. We need to make use of energy efficient technologies in the construction and every other aspect of, of, of the project. And so, uh, for example, the design is going to be such that uh, they would not have to use so much energy. So, for example, glazing will be discouraged very much in favor of open ventilation and so on and so forth. Um, there are ideas and thoughts about uh, the use of solar technology and so on and so forth. But it's all about funding. Remember, the initial cost of such installations can be very, very high. And so, as we move on, we'll look at the various options. Of, 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 of greenery mm. or the greenery program that okay. uh, we Right. And uh, currently, as we speak, those within the APAT area are not uh, in temporary shelters. Um, what are the plans in place for, for these people? In the meantime, when you start construction, are they still going to be in the community or are you relocating them for, for a while? Um, and how long will, you even, will that exercise take? Well, after the disaster, they have okay. since been relocated yeah. to a temporary camp yeah. where they are. A lot of them are in the tents. Currently, we're working on um, trying to roof some units that were done by um, a mining firm some time back mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to relocate some of such communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that didn't happen. And so we have taken up that and we put in the roofs and uh, making some improvements to allow uh, them to live there comfortable as the rains come. Mm. And so uh, the coming of the rains in itself um, exerts much pressure on us mm. uh, to work very hard and fast uh, to ensure that these people... Okay, so let me get the approach. You're, you're moving them out of the community? They have since been out of the uh, community. Well, okay, so they are still within the area or out of the co community totally? Out, just mm. about a kilometer away. Away, from okay, the, just to uh, make the, way the for... for, yes, for, for the construction. Okay. This is a temporary... 
internally displaced camp. Okay. You know that. So, so it means that for, for sure they will be here, for, they'll be there till the end of the year? Yes, yes, until the construction w is will, completed. Will you allow for at least economic activities to be going on while the reconstruction is happening? Because if you look at the area where, where they find themselves in, you're just talking about that, that that's a, a town that has a linear settlement, if I could refer to it that way. Have, you have many activities going around there. These are people who rely on these economic activities. Are you mindful of that as well? Well, on the construction side? No, not necessarily the construction side. At least some of the roads have yeah. been, the main road yes. has been reconstructed. Will you allow some of the indigenous to come through, work at least for the day, and then go back to their settlement? They are already working. Mm. Majority of them are into farming, okay. others into mining. They, go up. they are still going about mm. the activity mm. of rosa retailing. Okay. It's going on. Even in the camp, there are others who are already doing business, and that's going on in earnest. I don't think that is proscribed in any way. Mm. Uh, what we may not allow to happen now is for to allow people to the construction site because of safety safety issues. Mm. Mm. Right. right. Uh, we need to wrap up, but what assurances can you give uh, our viewers out there about this project? Well, the assurances is that the uh, government's commitment and directive is going to be followed as far as and the evidence is there. We have done the plan. Uh, the uh, 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 Building processes are going to start for the construction. The, those working on the roads are already on site, working. Uh, we're going to see that start alongside the building of the units. And once that is done, the allocations will be done. We do have a few challenges regarding people still um, insisting, for example, that we do not locate them away from mm. where they used to be. So these are some of the challenges we're trying to negotiate. Mm. Uh, with them, and uh, we hope that uh, by close of year, as uh, the deadline has uh, been fixed, we'll be able to uh, finish with everything. Right, uh, I'm, I'm grateful that you've been able to Thank join you. us uh, here on, on the polls. But uh, we need to cross you over now to Parliament, where my colleague uh, Paka Wilson is joining us uh, live on on phone uh, to give us updates on today's proceedings. Uh, Paka, what more can you report? Well, um, pleasure. Today's Parliament didn't really do much. Their main concentration were on the football match between the Black Stars and, of course, the Super Eagles of Nigeria. And so uh, this morning, when the chamber, the MPs began some solidarity messages for the members of um, the, the Black Star. And so they raised the point about the need for Ghanaians to rally support behind them in spite of all the difficulties. The member of parliament for Tolong constituency, Habib Idrisu, was the one who raised the matter on the floor. And he predicted three goals for the blast that. Three, three goals for, for the for the blast that. And there are others who also indicated that it is possible, even though the blast that had a symbolic performance during the Afghan, this time, in spite of all the time games that they've gone through, people or Ghanaians or the supporters should ensure that they give them all their support so they can win this game. So that has been the conversation on the floor of the house this, this morning. Now, the business statement was read, and finally we are told that the president, Nanata Danko Kufado, will be in the chamber next week. But next week, Wednesday, we'll be addressing the House to deliver a message on the state of the nation on Wednesday. So members of our have been asked to be in the chamber on time and also ensure that after the uh, message, they debate the matter or they debate the information that the president will bring to the House. Again, three ministers, the National Security Minister, the Defense and Interior Minister, have all been summoned to the House to brief members on the recent Boko disturbance, the even though we are told that uh, there is relatively calm in the area, members of parliament would want to know what specific measures are being taken by these three ministers to ensure that uh, the, the, what, what happened in recent times does not recur. And finally, the land and natural resources for the staff, someone like Bujina will also be in the house to update the NPs on government fights towards illegal mining or what we call Galamsey. So today, these 
these are the issues Parliament raised right after the business statement. Uh, all they did was to check black stars or and ask them to ensure that they can reach it for the country. Mm. Uh, now, uh, Parker, do we, do we know what accounted for the delay of the uh, State of the Nation address, uh, particularly when, when there were indications that the President was going to do this earlier? Well, so the understanding is that you all, the President was earlier scheduled for March 3, 2022. That's about three weeks ago. Now, from 10th of March to the 6th of March, uh, the President was coming to deliver a State of the Nation address on the 10th of March, and on the 6th of March, also address the nation on the Independence Day. Now, the committee put together to ensure that the State of the Nation address is delivered in the view thought that it wouldn't be prudent for the President to speak in Parliament on the 10th, and three days later, also go and speak at the Independence Day address of the nation. With that, members of Parliament will not even have enough time to debate on the present message. And that is why they decided to reschedule the date to today. In fact, they also were looking at the accountability of the Speaker of Parliament, Aban Babin, and the President. So now they are clear, but Aban Babin is in town at the moment. We are told he, he arrived two days ago, and he will be in town for some time. So since Aban Babin is within the jurisdiction, then it is proper to now reschedule the President for him to come and oblige with what the Constitution says that uh, he has to address Parliament at the beginning of the sitting of uh, uh, the, the House. And so that is why there was a delay. But now, since the speaker is available, the President himself is available, on the 30th of March, next week Wednesday, he will be in the House to address them. Parker Wilson, I'm grateful that you've been able to give us the latest uh, from Parliament. The head of uh, the Commercial Law Department at the Kwame Nkrumah University of uh, Science and Technology is recommending amendments of uh, existing laws to make completion of senior high schools mandatory for marriage in Ghana. This, according to Dr. Ernesto Ozu Dapa, will go a long way towards uh, protecting minors, uh, particularly girls, from being married off at a young age. Dr. Osudapa believes enacting or amending laws on marriage to make completion of SHS compulsory is in the right direction at the time the country has introduced free senior high school policy. I would um, welcome any debate meant to culminate into passage of a law which will say that, yes, as a society, in accordance with the directive principles of state policy of the 1992 Constitution, we need to have a citizenry where the minimum level of education is what? Secondary school. And for that matter, we are not going to uh, encourage and allow people to marry until they have completed secondary school. So that like completing secondary school education become part of the qualification or your eligibility to get married. It would be a good idea. Now that you have the free SHS, if there could be a law making it compulsory that it also means that we even have to do some consequential uh, amendment to maybe our marriage legislation and all that and say that if you want to marry under ordinance, if you want to go through any marriage under our law, not until you have completed SHS, you are not ready for, 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 for marriage. As a radical step to prevent underage girls from being married off, NGOs in child rights want birth certificates of brides to be used as evidence before such marriages are contracted, especially by Islamic leaders. Ben Marquisia Mankwa is the national coordinator one that I will recommend is that there should be an element of birth registration to let us know that the child is above 18 years. And even here in Ghana, sometimes people think that uh, if you are above 18 years, you can enter into marriage. But they forgot that if you are above 18 years, you cannot really enter into what we call the custom marriage. Because if you are 21 years, that is when you can sign a contract. And marriage is a contract. So some of these things, the priests, the imams, and other people need to begin to be educated on so that they can also educate other people that will come to them. From Kumasi, for Joy News, 
Kwame Interia reporting. Well, joining me via Zoom now is Dr. Ruth uh, Osu Enchi, president um, of uh, the uh, association uh, which uh, deals with psychiatric issues uh, here in Ghana. Uh, Doc, it's uh, such a good time to be speaking to you. So how do we really address this? Some experts are saying make it compulsory if you want to um, get married. Uh, particularly in these communities, let's see your birth certificate before we go ahead with the exercise. Is that, is that a much more sustainable way of dealing with this? Uh, it appears that um, there are some challenges uh, for Dr. Osu. Uh, Dr. Osu, if you can hear me, uh, let me try one more time and see uh, if this will be um, very much uh, better in terms of the network. But um, if you can hear me, I'm asking uh, whether or not it will be feasible using the approach that the aspects are asking for the use of birth certificates uh, in marrying of these brides within, particularly within the um, Islamic communities. Uh, is that a feasible solution to all of this? Well, thank you very much, and a very good afternoon. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, Forgive so, me, yeah. it's not too good. But yes, that will be one of the areas, um, one of the ways we can use to ensure that only girls who are mature will be the only way. Um, I have talked about other ways which include educating these girls, in fact, inculcating um, some of these issues in the educational curriculum right at the very early stage, as early as maybe upper primary, and letting these girls um, understand how they would say no, um, the steps they would take to report such matters in case they are being forced into marriage, whichever reasons there are, they would be able to report. Apologies there, uh, Dr. Osu. Doc, you, you, we seem to be uh, losing you intermittently. If you, if you could just uh, make the point for us finally. Yes, so I was saying that education is one of the key means of um, doing away with this this menace in the 21st century people should know they are right people should do the right thing and um, just birth certificate may not be enough to deter people from entering into uh, um, such marriages or forcing girls into such marriages but if the girls are well equipped with education to know that it is not a right thing it's a form of abuse and in addition to that they are Away from shelters to, to, to receive these people psychological therapy and assistance when they are being forced into such marriages. Then these girls will be economically, um, academically, and socially empowered to say no to child marriages. And so, yes, um, the best certificates uh, will be good, but that will not be the only way. I strongly advocate that in the educational curriculum, some of these things are inculcated. Dr. Osu Enchi, um, unfortunately, we'll have to wrap up uh, here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, now, the government is being uh, cautioned to hasten uh, in cutting public uh, expenditure, uh, uh, particularly issues relating to universities from uh, its subventions as a measure to save the economy from its current challenges. Students who have shared their thoughts with Joy News believe this will hurt their future and want government to um, have a rethink. Joy News' Samuel Kujo Brace has the rest of the story. What's for me is that, like, my parents suffer because uh, before they get the money to for me to come to school. That's Adriana, a level 200 economic student of Ghana's premier university, University of Ghana, Legon. She is worried about government's latest decision to take out public universities from its subvention. She says she's from a poor home, and this, if implemented, will hurt her future. So if he is the president, he should consider those who don't have money, but their parents are working hard to get the money to, for them to come to university. So he should try to, like, maybe do something who, who should favor those who don't have money and those who, uh, who have money at the same time. Adriana is not alone in this. Many of her compatriots believe this decision will be detrimental to the chances of many young people who aspire for higher education. It is done. A lot of people will have to drop out of school since they can't afford. Yes, and it will affect us negatively. If 
is being transferred to we the students to make the full payment it's going to cause a lot of harm you understand because um, we believe even in the SHS they are being given free education and the rest so what about we in the advanced worlds there this is the part of the education where students are even being paid to offer the researches they are doing but here we are doing it on our own strength and we believe it's the time for the government to support us after all right from here we are into the national service to save the nation and the price there doesn't fit the amount we are supposed to be paid as salaries so i think this where the government actually have to invest in us so that it can make good use of us when you come out of the university if they increase the um, university fees okay for me it will be fine for me but um like considering others who are coming from poor homes uh, it will be like somehow difficult for them because they can't afford to like pay their the amount the new amount of fees that will be given to us i would like to see that um government should consider like their decision and then like make it in such a way that it will benefit all of us because some of us are coming from poor homes and once they increase the amount it's not all of us that will pay so they should consider that the announcement by the finance minister must be a welcome news to universities but an academic professor peter Corte who is the director of the Institute for Social and Statistical Research, ISA, believes though it is a welcoming news for Ghanaian public universities, government must hasten slowly. He says it will be a huge burden for students and parents who will be the ultimate bearers of the impact of this decision to carry. I think the universities will be very excited about this policy provided government can really win the investors off its payroll because as we speak the kind of fees we charge are three four years fees we were charging anytime we want to charge fees it has to go to parliament to approve and it takes years um, assuming you are using fees you charge three years ago to run the university today how feasible is that? You look at the exchange rate position, you look at the rate of inflation, it is just not feasible. So if we are allowed to charge fees at market rate, then we'll be able to raise enough to pay ourselves to you know, undertake all the facilities, infrastructure development, we have earmarked. Mm -hmm. However, I can foresee a public outcry. Mm -hmm. I can foresee students kicking against this market economy led approach uh, because if students enjoy free SHS, parents don't pay anything, then they come to the university and they are paying market rate. I, I believe not everybody can pay. So if we want to do this, then let's think through this carefully. Let's carry out a study to ascertain how it can be effectively done if there's going to be some loan scheme or scholarship scheme to absorb those who cannot pay let's let's have a discussion let's have a, a discourse on this get a report then when we roll it out we will not withdraw but rather we will implement this to the latter okay. from legon for joy news i am samuel kojo brace and you're welcome back to the polls now we know that the women's uh, commissioner's office of the D uh, distance uh, education school at the university of ghana is uh, uh, scaling up e efforts to help the national blood bank uh, by organizing a health outreach and a blood donation exercise the move is in collaboration with the uh, national blood service and uh, fortunately i have a lady and a gentleman joining us to talk about this uh, first of all uh, naomi uh, uh, Abiyakwa, uh, and also Stephen Adai, uh, he's with the National um, Blood Service and Naomi is from the office as well at uh, UG Distance Education School. So they would be telling us about this exercise and then we'll get the national picture as well. But let's start off with you, Naomi. Uh, what informed this decision to scale up um, your activity to organize um, a health outreach and then to do this in collaboration with the Na National Blood um, Service? Thank you very yeah. much. Mm -hmm. What informed this decision was prior to our elections. We all have our manifestos. Okay. So I was asked that that day, on a typical day, what would you do for the student body? Right. And I told them that the panel, uh, 
that I will organize blood donation and health screening exercise for the whole University of Ghana distance education. Right. And that is what is happening and mm. it's going to take off tomorrow. We'll be having health screening for hepatitis. We'll be doing BP monitoring, HB level estimation, and a whole lot. Mm. And we are looking forward to blood bank to also come in to support us. I mean, this subject is coming at a great time, particularly when we know that there are concerns that not many people out there want to go out voluntarily to, to give out blood. So, Stephen, let me bring you in at this point. Um, how crucial are some of these moves to the National Blood Service? Uh, the fact that you want student groups and organizations to join forces with you in uh, shoring up the blood bank? So, for us at the National Blood Service, I think this is a welcoming news, yeah. you know, because we are the agency mandated by the Ministry of Health mm. to uh, make sure that we, we collect blood, we screen the blood, make it wholesome for transfusion. And so anytime we have a people or organization like yeah. this coming in mm. to support us, it's a very welcoming news for us. So we always want to encourage um, other people or the public in general uh, to be part of this exercise because we all know what blood you mm. know, is all about. Mm. Yeah. Blood saves lives. Without blood, a lot of people lose their lives, especially women and children. And so we don't want that to happen. And uh, currently, as we speak, I must say that the, the, the blood situation at the blood bank um, is not anything. Yeah, I, I was just about coming to that. And that's why many people are lauding such, such initiatives. Um, I was just coming to that. The fact that there are reports, and we've heard this from, from uh, your outfit, that many people are not supporting you. Um, how bad is the situation and how much more help do you need um, to show up the blood bank? Yeah, especially when it comes to voluntary blood donation. Okay. It's very, very bad. Ghana, I think uh, we are more comfortable with the family replacement donation system. But then uh, at the service, we've said many times that family replacement system, well, though it's good, but it's not very, you know, sustainable. And so what we really need to do as a nation is to come back to you know ourselves and then put on that uh, voluntarism you know spirit and make sure that we donate blood on a voluntary basis um, we've said that uh, at the hospitals or hospital blood banks the blood should be waiting for the patient mm. but not the patient you know waiting for the blood and so when we all understand this and knowing also very well that blood donation is our civic responsibility then we will always make a conscious effort mm. to donate blood on a voluntary basis. Mm. So I think opportunities like this, um, we should all be part of it and then they donate. And let me bring in Naomi at this point. Naomi, how many uh, people are you expecting to participate in this um, exercise? We are looking at 200 to 250 students. Okay. Yeah, at, at least 250 persons should yes, participate please. in this. And, and what activities are you scheduled to, to, to carry out during this? Because it's not just a blood donation exercise. You're also educating people yes. on this, right? Yes. Tell us more about it. The education, today we were on Radio Universe. Okay. Mm. We spoke to the student body about the need for people to donate blood. The reason being that a lot of women sometimes bleed when they are delivering. I work at the obstetric department of Kolebu Teaching Hospital and it's very glary. The agency, the need of blood in the hospital. Some come, they lose their life, we lose the baby or the mother. And it's very bad and heartbreaking. So that is why I want to initiate this so that at least we have some blood reserve at the blood bank for use for mm. pregnant women. And we are doing this program to honor the maternity department of University of Ghana oh, Hospital. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, but, but what do you think is accounting for the hesitancy? Why people don't j just don't want to go out voluntarily to donate blood? Sometimes the meat, somebody yeah. thinks, oh, I don't have blood. But the person haven't even checked the amount of blood in his system. Mm -hmm. Maybe he or she has an air in excess. Yeah. You, you, may, you may see yourself as a uh, smallish, and so you <laughs> just don't want to go out and, and donate blood, right? So, so these are some of the factors accounting for that. But, but Stephen is also here. Uh, Stephen, uh, you, you have been dealing uh, directly with, with, with persons involved in this. So um, how do we break this myth that um, Naomi is talking about? The fact that some people just look at their physique and say, well, I don't think I'm, I'm up for this. If, I, if you draw my blood, I don't have anything else left. 
Yeah, it's true. So what we are doing, especially mm. at the service, is that before such exercises are carried out, right. we do um, education, like she said. So maybe a week or a day to the event, mm -hmm. we meet the, the, the population and then we talk to them. We try to uh, you know, tell them about the do's and don'ts about blood donation. And the, what, what we usually tell people is that, first of all, you, you must eat before you donate. Mm -hmm. You must be about 50 kg, that's the weight. And then also, it's an excess blood in you that we take. So if you don't have blood in you, we don't take that. Mm -hmm. So we do all these checks. And it's an advantage to the donor because that's the opportunity for you to go through that free medical check. You know, it's not our culture as a people to always go to the hospital to have that, uh, you know, uh, checks and all that. So when the opportunity comes for you to donate blood, you go through that exercise for free. And so these are some of the things that we do. So we mm. do education mm. uh, prior to the donation. And even after, our counselors are also there mm. when there's anything that we need to tell you as a donor. We do that. So superstition has been, you. yeah. Superstition has been a big challenge too, isn't it? It has. And the fact that people feel if you take my blood, you're then going to be using it for some other purposes. Great. Uh, right. And so, so what do you use the blood for? I guess it's a very critical question to put, to put out there too. Yeah. Blood, it's a drug. Mm -hmm. It's a drug. Right. It's just like you and I go to the pharmacy, or a doctor prescribes a drug for us to use. That is how blood is. There are people or patients whose lives depend so much on blood. Mm -hmm. Without blood, they lose their lives. And so such people, the accident victims, women, you know, going to deliver children with uh, malaria or anemic conditions and all that, there are a lot of people in the system that need blood. Even blood, we have it in components. There's a component we use to treat bends and all that. So that is the, 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 the medicinal aspect of, of blood. So people should uh, you know, disabuse their minds from this myth that blood is used for ritual. Mm. And another thing is that the blood that we collect, you can't use it for anything else because we use blood bags to collect the blood. In the blood bag, we have what we call anticoagulant, something that when you mix it with the blood, I don't know, well, having, I don't know how the rituals operate though. <laughs> so I can't tell uh, what they need and what they You've don't. You've not been there. <laughs> yes. And also, one assurance that I can give the public is mm. that we have batch numbers of all the blood that we collect. So if you donate blood today and you want to trace where your blood you know, goes and all that, you can do that. Oh, you're making the process transparent. Yeah, sure. Mm. You can do that. And even the patients that you know, took the blood, we even have records of all those things. Mm. So people shouldn't be afraid that right. their blood will be used for rituals and all. So, Naomi, let's talk about your office again and what more you'll be doing. Are there some plans you have to roll out um, a, a lot more of the, educative, uh, the education drive or some, some other activities? Mm. What, what more is in store uh, at your office um, to, to scale up education on such an important issue? We have put measures in place to encourage the students to donate blood, mm -hmm. we have some giveaways that will be given everybody who donates blood. Mm -hmm. And to add to it, we went, we, uh, went to some pharmaceutical companies and then they have given us some hematonics. So anybody who donates mm -hmm. their blood will be given hematonics. Mm -hmm. We went to lit up pharmaceuticals, they are coming to sponsor, they have even given the drugs already. And then M and G Pharmaceuticals, they have bring the drug already. Okay, so, so, so more, more organizations, organizations are, are joining, are joining mm. to help to make this SSS. Yeah, yeah but but you you put in place some more measures yes, uh, to, to scale, scale up. Yes. How about your colleagues? Are they willing to join hands with you so that you go into communities and and to carry on with this um, blood donation exercise? Yes, please. Blood donation exercise and health screening for me is not going to end in the University of Ghana after I've graduated. Right, right. Because I'm a leader in an association, the Union of Professional Nurses and Midwives Ghana. Okay. I'm the Deputy Secretary for Kolibu. And we, are have, we always have yearly blood donations and health screening exercise. Mm. So we will be doing it all every year. Every year. Yes, right, right, every year. Right. Uh, we're hoping that this exercise will, will continue and uh, for you Stephen uh, just that this is um, a time where we also need to explore uh, transparency in, in, in blood donation. You were talking about the fact that sometimes when people give the blood they don't know where it goes to so 
uh, some people also want to have the ability to track yeah. where it will end up. But what steps are you taking at your outfit to expand and make sure that there is transparency in that uh, process? Yeah, so what we are doing is that we are automating modes of our uh, you know, system. So, for example, we have a system called BSIS. That is where, when the blood comes, we enter them into our system and we make sure that it goes through all the processes mm. where you can trace them <clears throat> to wherever the blood goes. So these are the measures that we are putting in place. And we are also making sure that we do more public education to make things transparent. And we, our facility is also open up for you know, educational tours and things like that. So people who are ready, they want to know more how the service operates in um, separating blood into components and all that. And we are very much uh, ready to assist the public to do that. Mm. And we also call upon the media to also support us in this direction. Mm. Because this is a huge you know, uh, assignment for the nation mm. as well. And when people go out there with false information and all that, um, it actually it, you know, makes it difficult for us when we go out there and we talk to people to give blood. They don't understand the reason why they should always give blood. Mm. But I think that when we do more education, and uh, we make things transparent, like you're saying. Uh, people will come on board and then do. Uh, a joint news expose uh, uncovered um, some persons in facilities, uh, the health facilities, shortchanging people when they come for, for blood. They make them pay some, some amount of money that, that are not even sanctioned by, by your authority. How are you curbing such instances where the health facilities where you're storing some of these um, pints of blood? They're taking advantage of the system. Yeah, we know it's a challenge, you know, the system. But then, uh, fortunately, we've also put systems in place to make sure that those things are checked. For example, uh, those who do that, they, they bring people from other places to come and donate, you know, so that they can have access to that. But now, uh, because of the system that we have in place, when you donate, you know, we have all your, your details. When you are not due to donate, you can't donate, the system will, you know, uh, fish you out. And so this is one. And also we've uh, made sure that anybody who is found, you know, culpable uh, is made to face the law. Mm. And so we want to assure the public that mm. uh, the systems are working. So, so is, it, also, is it the case that you're not supposed to pay for it at all? No, you're supposed to pay for what we call the processing fee. The processing fee is just a, a little token that you pay on the cost of the materials that we use to collect the blood. I talk about blood bags, I talk about you know, reagents and all the other things that we use in processing the blood, making sure that the blood is safe and wholesome. So somebody you know, must pay for the cost. You know, government subvention is, is a bit low, so these are some of the things that we use to, to generate, you know, to make sure that the operation of the service is sustainable. Mm. And so we want to encourage people that if you need blood, go to the appropriate source. Yeah. Go to the appropriate source and okay, then uh, you'll, be, you'll be helped. Okay, then we need to wrap up. Naomi, mm -hmm. your message to your students and your colleagues out there. Um, some who may not even be with the um, School of Distance Education who want to be a part of this exercise. What's your message to them? My message to them is that the blood donation and health screening exercise is for everybody. Mm. Even every, all the community members living or everybody living around the University of Ghana can come. Those in Medina and East Environ they can all come and donate their blood. The blood is going to University of Ghana Hospital Maternity Department to save the life of pregnant women and their babies. Thank you. And for you, Stephen? Yeah, we want to encourage as many as you know can or will be available tomorrow to join the exercise. It's open to everyone, mm -hmm. not for the students alone. And also, going forward, anywhere you hear of blood donation, please be part of it and save a life. Yeah, you need to save a life. Uh, that's uh, Stephen Adaiba, who's the uh, PRO for the National Blood Service, and also Naomi Abankwa is the Women uh, Commissioner for the University of Ghana Distance uh, Education. Um, we'll return shortly after this break. Stay with us.
And you're welcome back. Cycling in schools is unheard of in our part of the world. Students at uh, Morgan International School Cycling Club, the first of its kind, uh, tr thrilled uh, as they ride uh, with the uh, Gladiator Cycling Club uh, on its uh, Echo Bike Mountain Trail. Michael Ashley has the rest of the story. One paddle at a time is the beginning of a new journey for the Gladiator Cycling Club. They prepare to ride some 80 kilometers from Accra to Aguna Swedru in the central region. Cycling is known for many health benefits, including improved blood flow, increased muscle strength and flexibility. Worldwide, cycling provides an alternative means of transport and also as a sport. However, it remains one of Ghana's least patronized sport. Today, the GCC hopes to change all that. The goal is to reach Morgan International Community School and assist the school to launch the first ever Echo Bike Mountain Trail. Chief Gladiator of GCC, Kojo Graham, he has been riding for more than 20 years. Now he is 60 years and continues to cycle. He says this is the first time a school is doing something of this nature and his club is glad to help cultivate cycling as a sport in the next generation. Uh, we believe that when you catch them young is always uh, better. I mean you can even just see the challenges we are facing even with the Black Stars as a team. It exposes a lack of institutional planning from the core. You know, and so even though cycling is not that popular, we believe that when you start from where we are starting now, you have a very great opportunity to generate interest at the level where it matters most, and which is at the youth level. Now we've here we here today, we had a ride with a six kilometer ride with the kids. I joined them, some of the glad and they really enjoyed it. You can see the excitement and all that. It's a long, tiring and dangerous journey. But the group makes it to the school. Headmaster of Morgan International School, Richard Laye, says he introduced cycling to serve as an alternative extracurricular activity that is environmentally friendly as it nearly leaves no carbon footprint. This is Morgan International Community School, right? We started in 2013. Today has been a very exciting day. We've had an eco biking trail together with the gladiators and it has been big fun. Right. Now, why a biking club you know to to start with we need a buoyant co-curricular program which in international school circles is also called the hidden curriculum which tends to complement the real academic curriculum that we are doing so one we have friendship we have bonding but the most important thing is the endurance that we build for instance look at the trail that we went it was a difficult trail. There were parts where we had to stop carrying our bikes. Some people slipped and fell. Some parts of the road were basically unnavigable. And for me, that is the very metaphor of life, where we have rough patches, we have smooth patches. We came in last because we got lost, which tells us that we should be, we should be smart, we should be savvy, you know. So it's been a great day for myself and my students. We've bonded more, and that is part of the reason why we had to establish this trail. The ride with the students covers six kilometers through the hills of Gumoa Manso. The experience was more than enough for the students. Monique Kisi is now considering using her bicycle more often. This has been my longest trip ever, like six kilometers. It's, it's actually not a joke, but it, was, it, was, it wasn't bad. My first, my, let's say um, the most difficult part was um, the ramp. Yeah, it was very hard, but I could do it. I could do it. I wish I could go again, but let's see what will happen. Let's see. It was actually one of my best experiences. Yeah, it's very fun. Some parents who were there to observe couldn't help but join the awards. Here is Paul Gia, who says cycling has been his long term passion and is happy the school has taken up the challenge. Cycling is, is one of my passions. I, I cycle because uh, it's exciting. I'm elated. Um, I taught him to ride at home long before he dreamt of coming here. So when we heard that uh, cycling was going to be a part of the curriculum, we were excited. He brought his bike here and today, wow, 
they are doing it ex extensively. Although cycling is entertaining, Kojo Graham says they are constantly faced with many challenges, especially the absence of dedicated cycling lane on major streets. He says cyclists sometimes find themselves in life-threatening situations when they use the highway. Number one challenge, as I said, over the years we've seen a, a gradual uh, threat to our safety from uh, vehicular uh, activity in terms of cars and, and vehicles and it's become uh, the key thing for our safety has become so important for us now so we feel that in as much as we try at the national level uh, there should be some form of support for road safety not only for cyclists but also for motorcyclists as well so this is the number one concern the group hopes to pilot their partnership with morgan international school as it intends to introduce cycling as an alternative sport to many schools across the country. For Joy News, Michael Ashale. Promasi Ghana, producers of uh, cowboy products in partnership with the World Vision uh, Ghana, uh, has handed over two new uh, hand pump bottles to the communities at Kadinga in the Kasinanankana West District of the Upper East Region. The two communities, uh, Adil and Longo, uh, hitherto had extreme difficulties getting access to portable drinking water. The boreholes were constructed for the communities under the Cowbell uh, boreholes project uh, as part of the Cowbell Impact in Lives campaign. Correspondent Albert Sorry now reports. The Kasana Nankana West District of the Upper East Region is one of the areas where the lack of access to clean drinking water is a serious challenge. At the Adieu, and longer communities inside Kandega in this district, it was even more precarious as the people often struggled commuting long distances to other communities to look for water. School children were also bearing the brunt of the lack of water in these communities as they lost many lesson hours looking for water to prepare for school. They also battled with tests when the sun became hot during school hours. The chief of Kandega, Naba Henry Abawene Aminga Itigo, said the lack of access to water became a bigger problem for him and the people in the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. Water, they say, is life. So when we struggle for water, it means we struggle to stay alive. It was not easy for the people of this community, especially when the coronavirus pandemic broke out and hand washing became crucial. Promacido Ghana, the producers of Carbell products in partnership with World Vision Ghana, have come to the aid of the Adieu and Longo communities here at Kandega by constructing a borehole for each community. The boreholes were constructed under the Cowbell Boreholes Project as part of the Cowbell Impacting Lives campaign and commissioned to mark World Water Day, which was observed on the 22nd of March. Joseph Ashong works with Promacido Ghana. Uh, the borehole project is actually part of uh, a series of social responsibility interventions that we put in place during our 20th anniversary somewhere 2019. So what we are seeing here is part of the plans that we had in place uh, to give communities that are vulnerable, that are actually lacking uh, potable water. If you follow how we are even celebrating this year's World Water Day, the emphasis is on underground water. And this to say underground water per our own activities in the community, farming and other stuff also endangers the quality of this underground water. So normally we advise that they should take good care of this facility and our partners assure us that this facility, if taken good care of, could last for almost 50 years. And that means generations on generations will come and benefit from this. He said more communities across the country will benefit from the next phase of the project. This actually is a, uh, marks the end of the first phase. Uh, we're going to start uh, the next phase, hopefully this year, where we are estimating to give uh, to touch base in about 30 more communities of such caliber, providing boreholes and potable water to vulnerable communities in the, in the country. 
The boreholes were constructed in partnership with World Vision Ghana, a Christian relief, development and advocacy organization dedicated to working with children, families and communities to overcome poverty and injustice. Richard Okine is Integrated Programs Director at World Vision. Uh, we've been working uh, in the most challenging context to provide water to communities and our objective is to ensure that this water brings good health to children. It also brings access to uh, education because the time taken for children to commute to school uh, is reduced when uh, water is provided. For the people of the Adio and Longo communities, the new boreholes have come as a huge sigh of relief because they have been provided at a time when temperatures in this part of the country can go as high as 43 degrees Celsius. For Joy News, Albert Sorry, Kandega, Upper East Region. Thank you to the Bono East region, uh, which boasts of several tourist attractions, including the Kinchampo Waterfalls, the uh, Boyam uh, Bat, Bat Cave, uh, and also the Boabeng Monkey Sanctuary, amongst others. Uh, however, uh, little known of um, the Kunsu community, rich in important historical landmarks. As part of our Ghanaman series, my colleague Anna Savit paid a visit to the Kunsu community that served as the center of the slave trade in then Gold Coast with some of the slave market structures still in existence. Kunsu is a predominantly farming community here in the Kintempo North Municipality of the Bono East region. The community is one of the key traditional towns in the area and is noted for its rich but unharnessed ecotourism potentials. History has it that Kunsu served as the center of slave trade in the then Gold Coast with some of the slave market structures still in existence. Where I'm standing now is called Mraeso. Of course, uh, the people here say this used to be a slave market in the 18th uh, century. You see this fencing, of course, this is the entrance into this market that served that particular purpose. And uh, after they assembled here, the trading activity goes on before some are dispatched through Abiasi, some through Bonomanso, and then they end up at the coastal areas before they find themselves onto the sea and into the other parts of the world. Uh, we're telling you this rich history today as part of the Alganaman series. Join us as we do this together. Kuzu was a triangular area. From far north, the slaves were captured. Nana Osahine Kweku Kranting II is the chief of Kunsu. He shares with me what happens next after the trading of these slaves here at the Mrayoso market. Those who came here, they were transported some to Abasi, to Kumasi, some of them from here to Maso. So we have two uh, posts, Maso and uh, Abasi. But the general station was here. So historically, this rocky mountain here called Bojama is where the slaves after the slave trade are being kept temporarily before they are being uh, you know uh, moved to either Bonomanso or through Abasi and then on their way to the coastal areas. All the slaves captured were brought kept in the, um, uh, that Bojama and the, the, the rock then Europeans, they came and then took them some, some away. But since they were working, when they get to Maso, uh, they lodge there for a long time. Then they continue. This will be also go to Abasi, from Abasi, and then uh, that area, then they also go to Kumasi. These beautiful rocky mountains, according to the people here, is a very rich tourist attraction site because of the roles it played in the past. Joshua Onyan Kunton is a resident here. It's a very, very tourist attraction indeed. It's a history, it's, you know, it's a, uh, in fact, our fathers, our grandfathers suffered a lot. This same rock serves as a hiding point for
for children and women. And of course, during world periods, uh, they hide the children and the women here uh, from harm. And that is how come they call it Boa Jama, uh, meaning a Boa, a Jama. During the time of the slavery retreat, when our ancestors were, were for war, they would go and keep the women and the children at that hill top there. Now you call it Oboa or Jimba. Because you can't climb the mountain. You can't. The Oboa or Jimba. So you can never go there. If you are from uh, 20 miles away, they will see you. And you can't climb it too. That's Oboa that's or Jimba. That's meaning Oboa or Jimba. So our uh, success go and you know, and fight for their peace. For now, signing Kweku Kranton the second. If measures are not taken to help develop the site as well as document this history, it would fade away with time. The my senior chiefs, my uncles and most of them were public uh, elites. But me as a little educated, I've tried to sell it out. And every gathering and whoever case comes to me, and I get them the story. You see, uh, right now, the market center, the state market, is depleting because people have cut almost all the trees. We have a, a, a big bubble tree with carries everything around. They've sold the wall. The wall. And, and one of my reports, I said that it's going to generate funds even for the municipal assembly at Kintabo. If they're able to manufacture, help it, to develop it well, it will be one of the best tourist areas within the area. But they tell the news, they go and nothing comes in. So for our Ghana Man series today, this is Kunsu, a community from the Kintampo South Municipality of the Boni East Region. My name is Anna Sabit reporting for Joy News. And that's all we have for you in this package of the polls. My name is Blaise Sugan. Don't forget to log on to myjoyonline.com uh, for more updates on all of our stories. We'll see you same time next week.